Welcome back to ECE 442-542. This is one week from the end. Is that true? I think a week from today is our last class. Homework number seven is due the day before that last day. It's due on Tuesday, an odd day, but Monday apparently you have a design day if you are a senior in the capstone class. Your project is due on the last day of class, on the 1st of May. Teacher course evaluations are likewise due then, but homework number eight, which you can work for extra credit, is due on reading day, the 2nd. If you choose not to do that homework for extra credit, you might want to look at it or look at the solutions because the material itself will be on the final exam, which is a week from the day that it is due. So the final exam is Thursday, May 9th from 1 to 3, and it will be in this room if you are taking it on campus. Just to simplify writing, I'm going to precede TSS with two different letters, C or D, depending on whether I'm talking about continuous time state space or discrete time state space. If you see TSS, I'm talking state space, and which time will depend on whether it's C for continuous or D for discrete. And here's what we want to work through today is begin unit 8 which is dealing with control design in a state space setting or when our system is now modeled in a state space representation and we may design our controller as consistent with that representation and the first controller that we will look at is full state feedback which really means now we measure every state variable that we have modeled and scale that by some parameter k sub j or k sub i and feed that combination of weighted and scaled or scaled and combined state variables to form our input u of n into the system. We'll also, well, I might remind you, I hope that's available to you. I need to check. If you don't find lecture 4.3 A and B earlier in the class, let me know. I forgot to check on that before class to make sure it's in Unit 4. But that's from a little while ago, actually five years ago. So see if you can find that if you want to know how do you go from continuous time state space to discrete time state space. It is there. So it's dealing with how do you find this matrix exponential? That's one of the pieces. And how do you find the input matrix in a discrete time system, which we call gamma? We will summarize the square that we need to be very familiar with, which is the zero order equivalence in discrete or discrete equivalence of state space representation using the zero order hold equivalent. And today we'll actually go through one direction, going from a transfer function g of z to the discrete time state space in that summary square. And then we'll talk about state feedback. We'll look at a general discrete time state space block diagram and talk about the process or work through the process for designing the full state feedback gain matrix K. How do we find this matrix K? And the K, this feedback gain, is really trying to modify our system dynamics. We may not be happy with what they originally are, and we want to introduce feedback to try to change those dynamics. And now you might be thinking about our favorite shapes hearts, circles, and wedges. Those correspond to regions in the complex z-plane that we might like our desired poles where we might want them to be located based on how do we pick this full state feedback gain matrix K. Pardon? 
I still didn't get, oh, the magic number, okay. I'm not following, obviously. I was thinking about something else, and I'm going, it's not 517, is it? But now we've surpassed our goal in terms of student presence. Then we'll talk about issues with state feedback. We are assuming that the full state feedback vector is available, or all of the signals that we've identified as state variables, they are available we can measure them, we can scale them, and then feed those back. We will also be assuming or we will need to check is our system controllable and we'll talk about the the way or the algorithm to do that. Can we check controllability of our system? And we'll look at two different ways of controlling the system. One you can think of as a regulator design and that one might be useful for when your system is really just responding to initial conditions and you want to know can we change the transient behavior we're not trying to tell the system where to go we're just telling it how to behave now maybe you're familiar with those two commands behave you behave so K is telling the system how to behave and this one's maybe when you got a little bit older, but maybe your friends would tell you where to go. And then we'll talk about a reference input as far as where do we want this system to go? Do we want it to go to six? Do we want it to go to four? And that's then the reference input, and we're going to be dealing with two different questions. And the main one really is to behave. How do we want the system to behave? Here's the notation that we will be using. And I may get sloppy with the output matrix or the output equation. I might introduce C and D in there instead of H and J. But the, in a discrete time state space system, this is the model that we will be using. Phi is our open loop system matrix and now I know why I'm using L in this particular representation is because I'm using lowercase n for the dimension of the state vector and I didn't want that to be my time index in my arguments of all of my vectors that's why it's in L if somebody was asking, now you can tell them. That's why I switched to L as a time index. X, one time step into the future, is phi X of L plus gamma, that's our input matrix, U of L. Our output matrix is H, and our direct feed-through matrix is J in the output equation. And that's a just a algebraic relationship. The output Y is simply a linear combination of the state and a direct feed through from the input if that connection exists. And in this discussion, we will assume, if we need to, that the state vector X is Nevada tall, N, little n tall. That could be 10. On the final, it might be 6. Maybe I won't go to 10. The number of inputs M, Michigan, maybe is 4. And the number of outputs Q, Quebec, how's that, for maybe 3 outputs. We could have 4 inputs, 3 outputs, and 6 state variables. And we will denote those as Q, M, and N. And here's a block diagram, and sometimes I may not get that descriptive on the delay block, but this delay block now is a vector delay block. It's a bank of n delays where our state vector x is n tall, Nevada tall. And if it's n tall, then we have n of those that are each delaying every component of our state vector x. Then we feed that information on each state vector x through this system matrix phi and that now is combined with the input 
that is directed into the system by the input matrix gamma, those combinations now tell the state where it's going to be one time step into the future based on the present value of the state x and the present value of the input u and the output y at the present time is a direct combination of the state variable x and you can see that I have abbreviated this block diagram I maybe should have included the direct feed through. If you had a direct feed through, boy you can't see that, maybe that's good, but you now sum that weighted input with the linear combination of the states that are linearly combined through the matrix H. And that's what that highlighted notation is supposed to be indicating. Sometimes it's helpful to look or think about what's happening in your system in this block diagram form instead of just writing the equations. Sometimes it gives you a more intuitive feel for how your system is connected and in that case sometimes it might even be helpful to explicitly show the in different delays and how everything sort of interconnects and maybe now state variable 4 is influencing directly state variable 2 and not any of the others for example. Here is our summary square of zero order hold equivalents. We have continuous time on the left and discrete time on the right and if I want to simply denote that I'm talking about one of those I might just say script C for the continuous time systems or script D for the discrete time systems. And this is just a way to interrelate or connect the different system representations that you might be presented with and in the upper left hand corner you have now a time domain continuous time state space representation x prime or x dot the time rate of change of your state vector is related to the present value of the state through the system matrix A A is the system matrix in the continuous time and B is the input matrix of the continuous time system you can sample with a zero order hold on the input and derive the relations for phi and gamma. And phi is just this matrix exponential that contains the continuous time system matrix A. Phi is now e to the at. Gamma you need to then integrate or form this integration operation to relate or interconnect the input matrix and continuous time B with this matrix exponential that involves the continuous time system matrix A. We've been playing main, mostly so far this semester with the lower half of that summary square in the frequency domain where you might have this transfer function g of s we haven't focused too much on how to obtain those either time domain or frequency domain we simply are handing you these g of s's or the a b c d matrices and saying okay here's your system in reality that may be the hardest part of your whole problem is finding the Rep a representation for your system and a state space representation is not unique you might find one and somebody else might find another but if you now both found a transfer function g of s that better be the same I even if your 
A's, B's, C's, and D's are not the same. You better end up with the same input-output relationship or the same G of S. And we've done the zero order hold equivalent in the lower half in the frequency domain, which is now this 1 minus Z inverse scaling the Z transform of G of S over S. And that's where you might like to use these tables that contain frequency domain, S domain, or Z domain in columns, and maybe even their time domain relationship. And the top expression in the lower right-hand box, you should be able to find by simply Z transforming that upper right-hand box in the time domain representation. And here I'm getting very colorful, but I tried to color code this. It's red and purple. The red corresponds to the continuous time matrices. The system matrix A is sprinkled throughout. The discrete time is in purple, and you really only have phi and gamma, and those are the result of performing these operations to obtain either gamma or phi for the discrete time state space representations. That can be on your crib sheet on the final, but you need to be comfortable Depending on where I put you down in this map or in this square, you should be able to navigate around and find or go to where you need to be. And most of our analysis or design will be over on the right-hand side in this class. And if you want a crutch, you can go to MATLAB and you can say, oh, I want to find a state space representation from this transfer function. And that's just TF2, the number 2, SS. And if you wanted to go the other way, if you had a state space representation and you wanted the transfer functions and you didn't want to do this matrix algebra, you could now say SS to TF if you wanted to go the other direction, state space to transfer function. What we're wanting to do is now, behind the scenes in MATLAB, we want to now do that for this example with G of Z. Starting with a transfer function, can we now obtain A, not the, but A, can we get A state space representation from that G of Z? There's several different state space representations that we could obtain. But now that we have all of these tools available to us, let me ask you a question just with this G of Z. Is this system stable or can it be stable with constant output feedback? That's my first question. I hope you can immediately say that in the open loop, it's not stable. You have a pole, you, uh, you immediately start looking at the denominator polynomial and factoring it. It's already there in pole zero form. Your factors are clearly identified, hopefully, and you see that you have a pole at zero which is okay, that's inside the unit circle, but one of your poles is at two. That's not okay. Now what we want to ask, or what I have asked, you may not have wanted to ask that, but I just assumed since I saw somebody pull out a napkin that you were sketching this system and assessing whether or not it is stable or can be stabilized with output feedback. And with output feedback, I'm assuming the traditional 
interconnection structure. We measure the output, we just feed that directly back, and then we have a gain in front of our plant, and we say, okay, is this closed loop system stable? And to do that, we're now interested in what's happening relative to the z-plane. We have a pole at zero and we have a pole at two. And we're asking the question, is this stable with constant output feedback? And by that question, what am I indirectly hoping that you do? draw the root locus. That's begging you to sketch the root locus. Now you pull out your plastic knife and you start slicing up the bread and some of you may have been at the store last night and purchased some bread but I don't know that. Maybe not. Maybe you were getting food first. Never mind. I had to get grocery, well pet groceries. How's that? So other things need to eat in the house other than myself, okay? Where was I? Cutting the bread. What part of the real line is on the root locus? I've already shown you. And you have two poles, and only two poles, which now says, what's your pole zero excess? Two, how many zeros at infinity do you have? Two, so now you know two branches of your root locus are going off to infinity and you actually know the direction that they're going. The fundamental direction is 180 divided by that two or 90 degrees. And because you just have two poles, they are going to break away at the exact midpoint between those two pole locations. And so one branch is going to go up, the other branch is going to go down with a real part at one, and now you simply have to envision whoops, what happens with that root locus relative to the unit circle. Is there ever a value or values or range of k that will allow both branches to be simultaneously inside the unit circle? No. They're going to break away right at one and one really isn't a stable location. We really want to be inside the unit circle and if we had two poles right on the unit circle and in this case at one, what would their initial condition response look like? If I now ask you, okay, go back a year or more in your educational process and inverse Laplace transform one over S squared, what would that inverse Laplace transform turn into? Now I've gone into the time or in the continuous time setting, but it's similar because s equal to zero looks like z equal to one. What happens when we inverse Laplace transform one over s squared? What happens when we inverse Laplace transform one over s? That's one, that's a constant, and one over s would be like operating on that with an integral is another way of thinking about it. And now if you integrate one, now we're going back to your calculus days. What happens when you integrate a constant? Now you get a t coming into play, and so this is going to go unbounded. It's going to grow linearly with time. And that's if you simply bump it or excite the initial conditions in your system, not even applying an input. This is not going to be stable. Where did the 1 over s squared come from? It really didn't come from anything on this picture. 
it came from my connection of discrete time and continuous time. Knowing that, what's the relationship between Z and S. I'm kind of reviewing for the final here, in a way. But how are they related? Or, stated another way, if I said, what does Z to the minus 1 correspond to in the time domain? The speed with which these answers are returning to me is just amazing. Maybe it's because you know you're in the last week of class. But what does z to the minus 1 correspond to? A delay, a unit delay, a delay of one sample period, capital T. What's a, sample pe what's a delay of capital T look like in the S domain? So if you said those are the connection between z and s, now you can say, oh, z is equal to e to the st. If s was equal to 0, z is equal to 1. We have two poles at z equal to 1. That's consistent with two poles at s equal to 0 in the s plane. And that's where my thought process was going or was when I was saying, oh, what happens when you now look at two poles at the origin in the s-plane versus these two poles at one in the z-plane? You're going to get the same generic behavior. You're going to get a growing waveform as a function of time. Now, what we want to do is actually convert this g of z into a state space representation. So that was really just sort of an aside. I wanted to pull out a napkin and draw a root locus. But now if we have this g of z, we want to find a state space representation, and here is the relationship between our outputs Z transform and the inputs Z transform. And finding those polynomials, if we cross multiply, Do you see how all of this is bringing back earlier material and now you're starting to maybe refresh and think about the final exam or preparing for the final exam? What if I now take this into the time domain? What's a z? If z to the minus 1 was a delay, z is an advance. z squared is an advance of 2 and now we can say that we can put this into the, t into the time domain by saying y of n plus 2 minus 2 of y of n plus 1 is equal to 3 u of n. There is now a time domain system representation. It's not a state space representation. This is now a difference equation. But now we should be able to pull this or put this difference equation into a state space representation. And one way that I like to do that is to simply start drawing a all delay block diagram and trying to now determine how y's and u's are interconnected based on this difference equation. Let's now build. an all delay block diagram. And I will just say that this is not the only way, but this is simply one approach to this problem. 
And now what I'm going to do in this strategy is I'm going to put all of those variables on one side of the equality sign and set it equal to zero. Or I'm now going to say that that linear difference equation must satisfy or remain true for that combination of y and u. I've simply subtracted three u of n from both sides. And if I now, from this system, if somebody handed me the outputs and the inputs, I could take the output two time steps into the future relative to, let's say, now, and the output one time step in the future, and scale it and subtract it and combine it with the present input scaled by three, in this way, and every time I do that, I better get a zero out. That's how the inputs and outputs are interrelated. And what I want to do is assume that I, in building this block diagram, I'm going to now assume that I have access to the present input and the present output, which, if I have the present input, and what I'm trying to do is reduce this equation down to basically just ending up with y of n. My first step is to say, well, what if I added 3 u of n to that? And what did I have? I actually had, to begin with, you could think of my block diagram is going to begin with a summing junction and initially going into that summing junction I had the three variables combined and that those three variables combined in the form that they are really are just zero. I'm now injecting zero into that summing junction. But now what I want to do is I'm saying oh you have the input u of n what if I take that and scale it by 3 and add that to 0? I should have given myself more room. I am. So now I have 3 scaling u and something is going to pop out here. And that's something that's going to pop out. I'm not very happy with my drawing today. <sighs> what if I combine those? That's really all I've done now. I'm adding to 0 3 u of n. And in doing that, I now have y of n plus 2 minus 2 y of n plus 1. That's the result of combining 0 with 3 u of n. And that signal right here is right there. That's coming out of that summing junction. And I said I have access to the output now and the input now. So the next thing I want to do in my all delay block diagram is actually delay that expression and generate something that I hope gets me closer to some y of n's. So now if I delay that, I, let me call this new, let me just call this alpha 1, that signal. So that now alpha 1 is 2, whoops, is y of n plus 2 minus 2 y of n plus 1. And I'm now delaying that by 1 time interval, and that's going to generate alpha sub 2, which is a delayed version of alpha 1, which is now y of n plus 1 minus 2 y of n. And that's now what's coming out 
there. That's alpha 2. And I can now introduce or combine that with 2y of n. Since I said that I have y of n at the present time available to me, and that yields y of n plus 1. Or up here in the block diagram, if I now have y of n available to me, I'm now going to add 2 y of n to alpha sub 2. That will now come out of that summing junction looking like y at n plus 1. And now I can connect one more delay block to, in fact, yield y of n. Question? So now what I'm doing is I'm assuming the question was where did the input and the output come from, maybe. What I'm saying is if you had a system, you can access the input now and the output now. And based on that assumption, we now can say, okay, if that's available to us, let's now try to use that information to come up with an interconnection of the y's and the u's that would actually be consistent with that first equation, the first difference equation. And we didn't do anything unallowed in this process. We just worked with the input now and the output now and combined those with some delay blocks and summing junctions and this fairly trivial block diagram, all delay block diagram, models that second order difference equation that we started with. And now we can use this to hopefully create our state space representation. We now have an all delay block diagram that involves gains, gain blocks, it involves summing junctions, and it, and it involves delay blocks. This is now a linear system. We simply need to label it appropriately to find a state space representation. And to do that, now what I'm going to do, so this, how much of this do I want to say? This could be alpha sub 3, where this was now alpha sub 3. And if I delay that, I get y of n. What I want to do now that I have that block diagram is I now want to label that block diagram in a certain way that will allow me to explicitly identify a state space representation. And the way that I can do that is to simply put or label the outputs of my delay blocks as state variables. So label the outputs of delay blocks as state variables. And the way that I'm going to label that is I'm going to label this rightmost delay blocks output as x sub 1 of n and the leftmost delay block I'm going to label as x sub 2 of n. And once I've labeled those two, now I just have to go to the input side of each of those delay blocks to find those state variables one time step into the future. Question. So now what was I, what do I need? The question I think was what is that? What is that supposed to be? And you guys need to help me. What did I do to find that? I started with alpha sub 2 equaling this. 
now what am I doing? I want to start chopping away terms from that expression and I have access to y of n and u of n. What I'm going to do then is I'm going to eliminate the minus 2 y of n by adding plus 2 y of n. That means that I'm injecting into this summing junction here a plus 2 y of n. I think the sign is correct. Any other questions on that block diagram? Where I was in explaining is now we can go on the left side or the input side of those delay blocks to find this is now x sub 1 of n plus 1 and this is x sub 2 of n plus 1. Those are outputs of summing junctions and I can now find what those are in terms of my other state variables and inputs by looking at all of the input signals coming into those summing junctions. Or what is x sub 1 of n plus 1? It has two inputs coming into it. There's one and there's another. And I simply now need to add those up. Or x sub 1 of n plus 1 is now going to be some linear combination of x1 of n, x2 of n, and possibly a u of n. And I want to fill in the top row of that representation. In this case, if I start with the uh, one coming in from the bottom, that's 2 times x sub 1 of n. That's one of the signals that form x sub 1 of n plus 1. And that just requires that I put a 2 in that particular entry. I have four elements in this phi matrix, and the upper left one is what's going to scale x sub 1. I work my way clockwise around that summing junction and I come to my second input to that rightmost summing junction and that's simply x sub 2 of n. I can pull that one into my equation in the top row by simply scaling x sub 2 with 1. And did I have a u of n coming in directly to that summing junction? No, so I have a 0 in the top row of the gamma matrix. And now I can find x sub 2 of n plus 1 in the same way. x sub 2 of n plus 1, I work my way around that summing junction and effectively there's only one input into that summing junction. And that is going to be 3 u of n. Question? Oh boy, did everyone hear that question? So I think the question was, what if y of n was in fact maybe 3x1 of n plus 2x2 of n minus u of n? Oh, why did I do that? But that's now I think the question which means that this mess is now coming in there, scaled by 2. I'm not sure that that was your question, but that's how I interpreted it. So now I have 2. So it, you would say 2y of n is coming in to form x sub 1 of n plus 1 you now would say, oh, x sub 1 of n plus 1 is 2y of n. But now you can't leave it in that form. You need to rewrite y of n in terms of state variables at the present time and input at the present time, 
which if y of n is in fact what I've indicated in the highlighted blue, you would take 2 and then just scale. And now you have x sub 1 of n plus 1 as combinations of state variables at the present time and inputs at the present time. That's not what we had in this. Is that going to be clear when you see these notes? So this is now a class question. <laughs> and somebody's going to go, I have no idea where that class question came from. Well, listen to the video. It's on YouTube at 6, whatever, 45 minutes into the class, roughly. So now you can fast forward to that point since you're listening to it. <laughs> All right. Are we okay with that? Was that what your question actually was? So, yes, I could have been confronted with a more <clears throat> involved block diagram and y of n might not have been just some trivial state variable, which it is here. y is in fact x1, but y could more generically be some combination of states and inputs. And if that's the case and you're feeding back y, you have to sort of identify what that is that's in fact going into the summing junctions, wherever they're going in. x sub 2 of n plus 1. I have no state variables coming in to make that up. I just have three u of n's. So I have nothing here, nothing there, and a 3 there. And this is now my system matrix of the discrete time system. And it's Nevada by Nevada. It's square. It's 2 by 2. The input matrix is gamma. And it's 2 rows tall. And I only had one input, so it's one column wide. And what is my output equation from this block diagram? This one's kind of trivial. y of n is just x sub 1 of n, and I now need to write that in terms of my standard state space representation format. y of n is x sub 1 of n, but that's equal to some linear combination of states and input u. And the only one that it is is x sub 1 of n, so now my output matrix h is 1 by 2, and the direct feed-through matrix J, which is nothing, is 1 by 1. That's now a state space representation. And if you're questioning, well, that looks like the only state space, well, you could actually get another state space by simply relabeling the outputs of the delay blocks and interchanging x1 and x2. And that's a trivial second state space representation for this same system. If you were questioning where's the non-uniqueness of a state space representation coming from or how does that arise, that's one way of quickly convincing yourself that, okay, it's not unique. Let's now look at changing the dynamic behavior of that system. Because we know it's not nice. We have one pole at 2 and one pole at the origin. The pole at 2 is unstable. 
with full state feedback, we're now saying that the input U into the system is going to be a scaled version of the state vector X at the present time. And U in general is a vector that's M elements tall, X is a vector that's n elements tall, and that equation needs to be dimensionally consistent, which means we're now saying the matrix K needs to be such that it multiplies an n by one vector to produce an m by one vector, or K, the state space or the full state feedback gain matrix now needs to have dimensions m by n. And if we go back to our example that we're, we were just working with, k is now one row tall and two columns wide. Or we now have k1 and K2 for the element entries in this one by two full state feedback gain matrix, where the one is the number of inputs, M, and two is the number of state components in. And we want to now find what k sub 1 and k sub 2 are to change the dynamics. Question? So now in full state feedback, we are, the question was, U only depends on a linear combination of the state. I think that's what the question was. And the answer is yes. <laughs> So we are in full state feedback. We're only assuming right now that the input is a linear combination of the state. In a, just a few minutes, we'll incorporate a reference input so we can tell this system where to go. Right now, we're just telling it to behave. And for the system to behave, we need a K. And to tell it where to go, we need a reference input. But right now, we're just looking at the first question, and that's how the system is going to behave. And if we wanted to look at this maybe from a block diagram perspective, we now want to find this matrix K that will allow us to change the system dynamics. And an intuitive way to see that is to go back and draw the diagram, the block diagram, our all delay block diagram. We had two delay blocks, a couple of summing junctions, and now I'm going to just go ahead and put my input coming in from the left. Here is the input u of l, and that actually is going to be a linear combination of the weighted states. But before I do that, let me just go ahead and complete the block diagram that we had before. There was our output y of l. This now was scaled by 2, and it also took into account x sub 2. And here was now x sub 1 of L, and here is x sub 2 of L. And I hope that you can see that in the way that we are combining the state variables to make the u, I'm going to be scaling x1 with k1. I'm going to go ahead and put the minus sign here and let that come back and 
be a part of U of L, and I'm going to scale x sub 2 with k sub 2 and take that away in addition to make u of l. So now u of l is equal to minus the input that this block diagram demonstrates is that u at time l is now minus k1 x1 of l minus k sub 2 x sub 2 of l. And hopefully you can see that if you wiggle K1 and K2 or adjust those, if those are now knobs on some panel, you can adjust K1 and you can adjust K2. And hopefully you can see that, wow, I could change the interconnection structure arbitrarily and make the dynamics whatever I want by the choice of K1 and K2. That's the insight that hopefully this block diagram provides this equation comes directly from the block diagram and you can now take out the minus sign and factor out the K1 and the K2 from X1 of L and X sub 2 of L to in fact generate this full state feedback expression that we started with or said that we were wanting to apply to our system. U of L is now equal to minus K X of L. Let's work through the algebra with this relationship and the description of our state space representation. And I'm going to call that now the full state feedback equations. We're starting with our standard state space dynamics in the open loop, and that was phi x of l plus gamma u of l. But now we want to use full state feedback. That means we're letting u of l actually be a function of x of l, or u of l is now minus k x of L. This is now the full state feedback. But that can be used to eliminate U of L. In our original model or system representation and now we are incorporating feedback. We're feeding back all of the state variables weighted by this state matrix K. Doing that we now have X at time L plus 1 is equal to phi X of L plus gamma times minus K X of L and that's not minus K, that's a, it's not a subtraction, that's a scaling amount. I hope that's clear. Or this now says that we have phi X of L minus gamma K X of L. Or factoring out the X on the right, we now have a new modified system matrix, which we can call our since we like phi for our system matrix, let's just subscript it with a C and say this is now our closed loop system matrix. The idea then is we now with this K matrix, we can modify the dynamic behavior of phi. Now we've changed our system to not be behaving as phi, but as phi sub c with feedback. And what we now want to do is figure out how do we create k to position the 
system dynamics and now the system dynamics in the state space system matrix are influenced by the eigenvalues of phi sub c. They were also influenced the open loop by the eigenvalues of phi. Let's go back to our example. to allow us to put numbers or to work through a specific case. Now phi sub c is phi minus gamma k. Or phi sub c is now equal to phi, which was 2, 1, 0, 0. That was phi minus gamma, which was 0, 3, and we know the structure of K. That has to be compatible with this gamma matrix so that its product gives us a 2 by 2 matrix. Or this is now K1, K2. That's the 1 by 2 row vector of our full state feedback gain matrix K. This is now phi sub C. I was just wanting to make sure you were playing along and everybody was paying attention. So that's phi sub c. This is phi, this is gamma, and that's k. Bless you. Now we can just combine all of this or we weight the top row by zero. So we're not changing the top row but we are changing each element in the bottom row of B or of gamma K or phi sub C is now 2 minus 3 K 1 1 and minus 3 K sub 2 And as I mentioned just a minute ago, we're actually interested in the eigenvalues of that closed loop system matrix phi sub c, which govern the dynamic behavior. And let me now call that polynomial that is going to give us when set equal to zero, the roots or the eigenvalues of phi sub c, this is now the determinant of zi minus phi sub c. That's how I can find the eigenvalues of phi sub c, where the eigenvalues now are going to be z's. Maybe I should have called those lambdas if you're used to eigenvalues being called lambdas. But now my determinant, I'm going to indicate by a vertical straight line, z times i, the identity matrix needs to be dimensionally consistent or compatible with phi sub c. It needs to be a 2 by 2 and we're subtracting phi sub c which was 2 minus 3 k1 and 1 minus 3 k sub 2. Or I now have z minus 2, 3k1 in the first column, and minus 1, and z plus 3k sub 2 in the second column. And a 2 by 2 determinant is now just the product of the diagonals minus the product of the off diagonals. We now have z minus 2 times z plus 3k sub 2 minus a minus 1 times 3k sub 1. And depending on how you want to multiply those two terms, maybe using some FOIL, first, outer, inner, and last. I don't know, did you guys learn that? Yes? Yeah, that's new to me, but that's now the what you learn in multiplying that out, but I just multiplied out. This is now our delta sub k of z, 
which is the first, z squared, and then the outer and inner give us minus 2 plus 3 k sub 2 z minus 6 k sub 2 for the last. And then I have a plus 3 k 1. And I'm going to call that, since it just looks so nice, I'm going to give it a star. So that formula now is a star, and what we want to do is figure out how do we pick k1 and k2. Well, that's going to be determined by what we want our desired closed-loop poles or closed-loop eigenvalues to be. So now let's talk about designing k, or this is now the process, We're finding K. In our example, K was equal to K1 and K sub 2. And here's the sort of the, the recipe. Step one. Now I started to do a Julia Childs imitation, but I won't talking about recipes. Now you want to hear that, but I don't. So now let's first, the first step is decide on a desired set of pole locations, or decide on what I'm calling the desired closed loop poles. And in our example, we had two poles. Let's just suppose, for illustration purposes, that we make them to be complex conjugates. Point 2 plus and minus j point. Point 8 plus and minus j point 2. Are those valid closed loop poles? I don't know, it looks like they add up to 1. No, they have to have a magnitude of 1, so it's 0.8 squared plus 0.2 squared. So we're okay that way. 0.64 plus 0.04. 0.6 at, we're inside the unit circle. Now, what we want to do once we have that is create the desired characteristic equation or characteristic, let me say, polynomial. I'm not yet wanting to solve it because I know where the roots are. Let me just get the polynomial. So now I'm going to get the polynomial using those desired closed loop poles and I'm going to call that desired characteristic polynomial sub d for desired. And I'm going to say that's delta sub d of z. In our example, delta sub d of z is now simply going to be z minus 0 0.8 minus j 0 0.2 times z minus 0 0.8 plus j 0 0.2. And you don't have to do it all this long way, but I'm just trying to verify or show you where the eventual... Do you see that if you do the inner and outer, those terms are going to cancel because we have conjugate pairs, and we're just going to have the first and the last of that foil or we now have z minus 0 0.8 squared plus, because we have j squared and we have a minus j squared, that gives us our plus 0 0.2 squared. So you could have started there. If somebody said, oh, I want a polynomial that has roots at 0.8 plus and minus j.2, you could now immediately say, oh, that means z minus 0.8 squared, that's the real part, plus the imaginary component squared. Or this now says we have z squared minus 2 times 0.8 times 0.2 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 times 0
times z plus 0.8 squared plus 0.2 squared, bless you, which is 0.04. Or now we have our desired characteristic polynomial that is now delta sub d of z equaling z squared minus 1.6z plus 0 0.68. And that I'm going to say is an important equation. So now I'm going to call that double star. And my third step in this recipe is to simply equate the coefficients that e exist in the two polynomials. The delta sub k, which comes from our phi minus gamma k determinant expression and the char desired characteristic polynomial. So equate coefficients in the two polynomials which I've been referring to as star and double star and that will allow us to solve for k. So now I have d delta sub k of z equaling delta sub d of z. That's step three. And in our example, we had delta sub k of z equaling z squared minus, or I'm sorry, plus, minus 2 plus 3k1, uh, not k1, k sub 2 times z, plus, there's the 3k1, minus 6k sub 2. And we want to equate that with delta sub d of z, which was, based on our desired pole locations, that was z squared minus 1.6z plus 0 0.68. And comparing coefficients of like powers of z, that's what I mean by equate coefficients, between the, so now we're going to equate like powers of z the z squared coefficient, that's trivial, but now the z to the 1 coefficient says that we have minus 1.6 equaling minus 2 plus 3 k sub 2. And in this particular case, we just have one of the unknowns in that equation. So we can solve for that immediately. And because of the time that we're looking at, let me just say that k sub 2 ends up being 0 0.133. In general, you might end up with two equations in two unknowns, and they have to be solved simultaneously. If we now look at the z to the 0 coefficients, we have 0 0.68 equaling, now we have two variables, but we already know one of them, but we now set that equal to 3 k1 minus 6 k sub 2. And if we plug in the k sub 2 that we just found, then we have one equation in terms of the last unknown case of 1, which is 0 0.4933, or just about one half. And that says then that our full state feedback gain matrix to achieve closed loop poles at 0.8 plus and minus j.2 needs to be one half and then 0.133.
and that choice of full state feedback gain will give us the desired closed loop poles that we want and that gives us now better performance relative to an unstable system that was at z equal to 2 as one of our open loop eigenvalues. And we'll pick up with telling this system where to go in our next time together.